This is JCT TV. This is Bible study for the 21st century. You know, friends, uh, for years and years and years, I remember when I was a kid watching uh, television and uh, Bible teachers, there's been a real focus on Bible prophecy. And I understand the interest in that. Everybody likes to think about the future. I've been dealing for the last few studies, and I'll continue today, with Mark chapter 13, where Jesus talks about the end of days. And if there's anybody who has the voice of authority on this topic, it is he. WOW works with local churches in needy countries. We mobilize those churches, pastors, and volunteers in a concerted effort to care for orphans and widows in their homes and villages. Through that strong faith-based platform, we're able to not only provide food, medicine, and crisis intervention, but we're also able to lead these afflicted ones to faith in God. It's powerful, humbling, and well worth the effort. Please support WOW with your generous gifts and faithful prayer. Thank you. So, last time we were looking at Jesus' words on the destruction of the temple and the sign of the end times. And as I said a moment ago, the end times is always a hot topic. And, you know, there's any number of preachers out there and Bible teachers ready to give you their spin on the end of days as they see it. There is that strong interpretive element that is always there uh, when teaching scripture, but especially when it comes to the end of days, you have not only an interpretive element, but also you have sometimes just good old fashioned spin, you know, uh, spinning it to fit one's own sense of what should happen, what could happen. And, you know, it can be quite sensational. It can be kind of, um, you know, national inquirish, you know, in terms of the, the headlines and the, the various emphases and so on. When you look at Jesus and he, and, and he's the only one I want to listen to when it comes to the end of days. When you look at him, you see a very calm, kind of easygoing almost uh, recitation of the contributing factors to the ramping up of uh, history towards the, the end of days. And uh, I got into the first part of Mark 13 last time. And I made the point, look, look, look at this here. I made the point, I'm not going to go over it again, but as he's talking about the end of days, he says, the gospel must first be preached to all the nations. And this to me is the, uh, the pivot point of any discussion of the end of days. Uh, uh, you know, when you, when you talk about Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, uh, each of them has, you know, their own approach to the story of Jesus. And under the, you know, the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, they still had the freedom to uh, record what they knew, what they'd heard, what they had, you know, discussed among themselves. Uh, as I've mentioned before, Mark was probably the first of the four gospel writers to write uh, a gospel. And Mark essentially was writing uh, the, um, the recollections of Peter. Peter, in his own epistle refers to his son Mark. He, he had taken Mark under his wing and was kind of mentoring him. The assumption a lot of Bible scholars make is that Mark's father had died. And as you may recall, I've commented on this before too, the upper room was probably the second floor of John uh, of uh, Mar John Mark's mother's, widowed mother's house. We don't know for sure, but I think there's a pretty good reason uh, to uh, go in that direction. Nevertheless, 
When he says, the gospel must first be preached to all the nations, he's quoting, of course, Jesus here. He's saying something that's absolutely pivotal. And so whatever has preceded it, whatever follows it in terms of Jesus' delineation of end time uh, protocols, the gospel preached to all the nations to me is the pivot point, all right? And uh, th that to me is a huge, huge uh, point that must be made. Okay, now let's, uh, let's pick it up in verse 14. I, maybe I should remind you that um, uh, Jesus talks about false messiahs in verse 6. He talks about war and rumors of war in verse 7. He talks about national and international tensions in verse 8. He talks about earthquakes and famines in verse, uh, in verse 8 as well. And he also talks about persecution of believers in verse 9. And then in verse 10, he talks about the gospel to all the nations. All right. Now let's pick it up in verse 14. So when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing where it ought not, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea fly, flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down into the house, or nor enter to take anything out of his house. And let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant, and to those who are nursing babies in those days. And pray that your flight may not be in winter. For in those days there will be tribulation such as not been seen since the beginning of the creation which God created until this time, nor ever shall be. And unless the Lord had shortened those days, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, whom he chose, he shortened the days. All right, now, there's so much there. And as I've said all along, as we've been doing JCTTV now for several years, I don't rush. I just take my time here. Uh, not just for my sake, because, you know, I'm a, I'm a slow read. <laughs> but for your sake, too. So we can take our time and follow the, the scriptures in a, a less than a haphazard fashion. Okay. In verse 14, he talks about the abomination of desolation. Now, it really helps. I, you know, I, I work hard at biblical languages. You know, I'm not really good in Greek, but I can get along in it. I'm not really good in Hebrew, but I can get along in it. And with my lexicons and dictionaries and some of the studies I've had in the past, living in Israel for seven years really helped with the Hebrew especially. Uh, I'm able to get pretty close to you know, the, the original language's meaning. And in this case, the abomination of desolation is perhaps better, uh, trans, uh, better re read as desolating sacrilege. The desolating sacrilege. Uh, what was the desolating sacrilege? I think to understand this, you have to understand how important and how central the temple was in the life and the history and the eschatology, meaning doctrine of the end times, of the Jewish people. The temple was the absolute epicenter of their faith and of their um, uh, religion. The temple was in Jerusalem, of course, uh, and the temple of Jesus' time was a temple that had been rebuilt by uh, Herod the Great. Uh, it didn't quite match the glorious splendors of Solomon's temple, but there are those who say there were three temples, some say four, <laughs> but generally speaking, the temple that Jesus is talking about was the, is re generally referred to as the second temple. Anyway, three times a year for Passover, for Pentecost, or Shavuot in Hebrew, or for Tabernacles, Sukkot, three times a year, the Old Testament mandated that every uh, Hebrew male needed to come up to Jerusalem, need to make pilgrimage, and to offer sacrifices. In Passover's case, Pesach, remembering the deliverance out of Egypt. Shavuot, Pentecost, remembering God's faithfulness in the harvest. Sukkot, also remembering God's faithfulness in the harvest. You had two planting seasons, two harvests in the, in the year. One was in the spring or June. One was in September, October. Also during that period of time in October, there was the um, Day of Atonement uh, when the sins of Israel were dealt with once a year, uh, but always in the temple. 
The temple was where the Holy of Holies was. The temple was where the Ark of the Covenant was. Uh, the temple was where all the sacrifices were made. And the sacrifices, of course, if you read the Old Testament, you read the historical books, you're seeing tens of thousands, tens of thousands, sometimes hundreds of thousands of sheep and goats and cattle and so on that were uh, slaughtered and sacrificed, you know, in order to meet heaven's requirements. That's not the case today, but that was the case then. The temple was absolutely huge. The temple was um, uh, operated by the, the Sadducees. They were kind of the elite, you know, in Jerusalem and in Israeli culture at the time. Uh, the high priest and all of his, you know, subordinates came from the uh, Sadducee uh, grouping. Um, it was uh, the place where there was huge business that happened because of pilgrims coming and going, not just for those three times a year, but also uh, just coming up whenever they could to Jerusalem to make sacrifices for various reasons. And so you had kiosks, you had, uh, you had um, money changers, you had people selling clothing. It was just like any major marketplace. This was all owned and operated by the Sadducees, and they got their cut. Uh, it was a big business. This is why when Jesus cleansed the temple on that one occasion, it was so upsetting, not just to the people and to the culture of the day, but also to the Sadducean uh, economy. Anyway, the temple was absolutely critical. The thing that set it apart, apart from its splendors, I mean, it was beautifully built, you know, especially during Solomon's time. But, you know, the, the, the artistry, uh, the stonework, uh, the, um, the gold, you know, the uh, the bronze, and we're, we're talking massive, and, and then all of the, the temple um, equipment during Solomon's time and even David's time, gold, gold, gold everywhere, gold shields, gold lavers, gold this, gold that. I mean, and, and from time to time, when uh, foreign armies would come in and sack Jerusalem, they would sh you know, carry away with them, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars in our terms worth of uh, temple equipment that was all covered in gold. But the key component there was the ark with the cherubim and the, 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 the view of the presence, the glory of God that was there, you know, resonant and overshadowing the Holy of Holies in the very center of the temple. This was what it was all about. It was absolutely the holy place. It was so holy where the ark was but the high priest could only go in once a year. He had to be specially prepared for it, specially cleansed. Otherwise, if anyone had the temerity to, to go into the Holy of Holies, apart from the, the high priest once a year, they would die. Okay? Now, I'm, I'm, I'm giving you all this information because when we come back after the break, uh, I want to explain to you further why this desolating sacrilege was such a concern. Um, and, you know, there have been various teachers over the years who've tried to make it into this or make it into that. It's much bigger than maybe some of what you have heard. And I'll be back with that right after this short break. The Bible tells us that true religion is visiting orphans and widows in their distress. The Bible also says that God is a father to the fatherless and a defender of widows. Heaven's core values for mankind begin with God's heart for the least of these. When you support WOW, you're in the sweet spot of God's heart for the poor. Yes, we're only a small player in this great drama, but at least we're on the field. Please give generously. Okay, let's get to this desolating sacrilege. Um, Daniel, the prophet, had uh, anticipated this in uh, Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. You can check that out sometime at your convenience. Uh, but Ezekiel, 
in chapters 8 through 10 of his uh, prophetic visions, uh, deals with it in greater uh, measure. Uh, and, and remember when you read Ezekiel, especially chapters 8 through 10, you're reading something that is referred to as apocalyptic, kind of like Dan, much of Daniel is apocalyptic and the book of Revelation is apocalyptic. What it is, it's visionary. Uh, it, it is kaleidoscopic in terms of just shifting imageries. You know, you can't, any, anyone who tries to systematize uh, apocalyptic literature, you know, is off, you know, to a dead end. I mean, you just, you just can't do it. Uh, the, what apocalyptic uh, writing does is it, it lifts your spirit above space and time. It gives you a sense of, you know, there, there's, there's something otherworldly and something parallel universe-ish about uh, the heavenlies that await us. Uh, I, I'm not going to go there now. That that requires you know some teaching almost on a university level. But when you read Ezekiel eight through ten, uh, you see that this is more than just one uh, image. This desolating sacrilege. Um, Antiochus Epiphanes, one of the uh, conquerors of Jerusalem and Israel at one point raised um, um, an idol basically to a pig, you know, or to the emperor, a combination of their, the, 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 the Jews who were horrified by this side as, as, as bad as uh, swine's blood, you know, right there in, in the temple. Um, and this was sometimes referred to as the abomination of desolation, but there's more to it. As you read Ezekiel, you see that there were ongoing sacrileges that essentially uh, were perpetrated by the people themselves. And, I, and I'm not going to get into all of that, but the fact is that it was a holy place that had made, been made unholy. Now, when you read, and you have to go to Josephus for this, who, you know, is the only real historian we have of those, uh, the days just after, you know, the 50, 60 years or so after Jesus, uh, you read about Titus, the Roman emperor, uh, coming in and uh, absolutely destroying Jerusalem and surrounding it for over a year, ramparts and battles. But you also read in, in Josephus the horrible things were being done within the city of Jerusalem itself by various groups of Jewish zealots against each other. We're talking about bodies in the streets, blood flowing to the point where people couldn't walk on the pavement without slipping. And it's horrors, horror on horror. And the temple area was made into a kind of a fortress by these guys. They're killing each other, and then they're, they're defending themselves against the Romans. The Romans are making incursions. And it's all happening in this temple complex that had been set up as a kind of a fortress. I mean, we're talking here about desolating sacrilege. Okay. So without going there in terms of trying to nail it down as to what the abomination of desolation was specifically, because I don't think you can do that. What I'm saying is the temple was anything but the holy place. And this happened more after uh, Jesus than during the time of Jesus. But when you go back to Ezekiel 8 through 10, which predates Epiphanes, Antiochus Epiphanes, nevertheless, there were horrors that were happening. There were kings of Israel and Judah, mainly of Judah, of course, who were setting up abominable practices in the temple area. There were kings in Israel who were s sacrificing their very firstborn to the fire god, Moloch. I mean, throwing their firstborn babies into an idol that had a big open mouth with a fire in it. You throw it into the fire to placate Moloch. Another one was uh, Palestinian or uh, Canaanite god, uh, Hemosh. Horrible things. There were, you know, uh, big poles set up for the worship of Astart, uh, a goddess of fertility. Uh, there were um, sacrifices made to various uh, heathen deities to the Baals. I mean, this all happened in the... T so, you know, Ezekiel in his apocalyptic vision in, in 8 through 10, he, 
he's he's kind of in a in a kind of a summary way painting a broad brush picture of how the temple had been desecrated again and again and again throughout the history of Israel. You know, we, we, we can look at it and say, well, gee, we'd never do that. You have no idea. Back in those, uh, in, in, in Hebrew, we have an expression in modern Israel, meod primitivi, which means very primitive. In that very primitive time when people were just getting to get a hint of who the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was, uh, it was more blood than not. It was more idolatry than not. There, there was more Baal worship, a start worship, than not. And God was so patient. At times he lost patience. And as we know from reading the historical books of the Old Testament, again and again, he lashed out at them through, you know, the Assyrians, through the Egyptians, through the Chaldeans, through the, the, uh, the Moabites. Uh, I mean, uh, the Canaanites, again and again, they, Israel was you know, on the brink of destruction, sometimes pretty much utterly destroyed, even thrown into years of uh, exile because God was so fed up with their idolatries and they're forgetting him. Okay, So, you know, when we talk about desolating sacrilege, what I'm saying is it's a big picture, Okay. And Jesus is saying, this is going to happen in verse 14. Let him who is on the housetop not go down into the house nor enter to take anything. He's saying, look, uh, there's a horrible time coming because of this desolating sacrilege. And he, he doesn't specify it, but we know from history that shortly after Jesus' resurrection and ascension, a few decades afterwards, the might of Rome swept in, and Jerusalem was just absolutely laid low. It was a horrible, horrible, horrible time. Not just from the outside, in terms of the Romans around the walls of the city, but from the inside with the various groups. There were three specific groups, and that's, that's another study, of Jewish zealots who were fighting one another and decimating the populace, uh, times of horrible hunger, uh, people eating their children, uh, blood in the streets, bodies everywhere, Jew on Jew, to say nothing Roman on Jew and Jew on Roman. I mean, this was a horrible time, okay? I don't mean to paint too bleak a picture, but you need to read a little history to understand that when Jesus was talking about what was coming, he wasn't kidding. It would be a short-term thing, but it also had long-term implications, right? So, when the time comes, Jesus is saying, well, look, look, look. Uh, let let uh, let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who's on the housetop not go down. To, don't go down the outdoor staircase to go into the house to get some of your valuables to escape. Escape while you can. All right. Let him who's in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant. Isn't it always the case? The pregnant mothers and the suckling children. Pray that your flight may not be in winter. You say, what? Winter? winter? Yes, winter. I lived there for seven years. The winter in Jerusalem can be horrible. Uh, we, I, I remember a couple winters when we had two and three feet of snow over the course of a few days. Um, it would melt very quickly, but horrible. And then six, seven weeks at a, at a stretch, the temperature just about zero degrees, or I should say just about zero centigrade, 32 Fahrenheit, with rain, 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 cold rain. The houses are not built for warmth. They're built for cool in the heat of spring and summer. And so very poor heating systems have heating systems at all. And people just shiver and they f almost freeze to death if they don't have some kind of protection. So winter is a horrible time there. In those days, there will be tribulation. There's going to be widespread tribulation. This isn't just an era, okay, of tribulation. And you get the impression sometimes when you read some books on prophecy and listen to some teachers on prophecy, that it's just a little. Tribulation was widespread historically for Israel. In the past, you know, under, under the Babylonians, under the um, Assyrians, uh, the Egyptians, you know, tribulation was sort of 
Israel's middle name. Um, but th he's talking here about a widespread tribulation that is going to accompany the, uh, the end of days. Okay? Um, and unless, verse 20, the Lord had shortened those days, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, whom he chose, he shortened the days. Um, next time, uh, I want to pick up from here, because if I get into it now, I won't have enough time to do it justice. And I'm sorry to keep you hanging here, but um, read uh, Catalan's Casual Commentary, if you have it, you know, on the entire, I've got two tranches on Mark, which I'll send you if you ask for it. And uh, you can involve your best donation <laughs> to keeping us on the air. But uh, you can read some of what I've written there, which kind of fills in the gaps. But next program, I'll get more into this topic, and I know it will be valuable. Why dance when you have very little? When you live from day to day with food insecurity, rampant disease, sickness, and death? You dance because your heart is full of love for God and your hope is strong. WOW has come alongside as the hands and feet of the Lord, providing both home-based care and assurance of God's love. You're happy and you've got to dance. Please support WOW. Let's keep them dancing. You know, speaking of tribulation, as I speak to you now, our whole world is under tribulation with COVID-19. I'm feeling it, you're feeling it, and none of us really knows how long this is going to last. There are some very bleak scenarios out there, and I'm not into being bleak, but the fact of the matter is, friends, we're all under stress, we're all under pressure. What I'm finding interesting is that people are rediscovering their spiritual values. And one of those values is the gospel, the good news about the Son of God. And I'm so impressed with your faithfulness in supporting this ministry. Remember when you support JCT TV, you're also supporting WOW. You see those promos in the program, Working for Orphans and Widows. We're one and the same. With JCT, we teach the gospel. With WOW, we try to live it out in being a father to the fatherless and defender of widows in Sub-Saharan Africa and India. When you support us, you're doing a good thing. Thanks for your help. Mm -hmm.